when we usually play video games, we're only doing it for the story or to play with our friends. A pastime or a job, regardless of what it is, we all have such fond memories of playing any video game. We all can remember video games for their gameplay, their storytelling, or even their music. Hell, I would tend to say that music in video games is not just background music, but a vital part of a game. And that's what I'm here to talk about today is the background music or just music in general in video games. So come take a gander with me at the most memorable and recognizable music in video games. This list that I've compiled is mostly just video games that I remember and other friends remember so fondly of that when we hear the tune, we instantly recognize what it's from, what video game it's from, even what section it's from. It could be from the composer, it could be from the game itself, it could just be a small section of it. Regardless, I might not have the same list as you might have, but I hope you can agree with me on some of these tunes. Let's play a little game. At the start of every section, I'm going to play a tune from the game and see if you can guess what it is. Try not to cheat by using the chapters, but let's go and start off with this first one. If you guessed Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, then you'd be right. I'm starting off with something simple, and nothing's as simple as Call of Duty. That's not an insult to the game. I'm going to be talking about Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, Black Ops 1, Black Ops 2, and World at War. We're going to start off with Modern Warfare 2. When I listen to the soundtrack of Modern Warfare 2 as a whole, it brings together a whole cinematic masterpiece that was Modern Warfare 2. I use masterpiece in the lightest of terms. I remember the soundtrack for being intense and straight to the point. The music that I remember so much of course, was the multiplayer music. When you're in the menu, making a class, hearing other people talk shit to each other, or maybe you're doing the shit talking yourself, it hypes you up for the next match. It makes you want to play more. It makes you feel involved. But along with that, you could also just be playing by yourself late at night. And anytime I hear this music, I'm instantly transported back to when I was a little kid playing Modern Warfare 2 by myself when my stepdad let me play on his Xbox 360. I have such fond memories, and that's why this music makes me so nostalgic along with the other Call of Duties as well. Call of Duty Black Ops 1. The multiplayer music in that, the violins, the bass and drums in the background come together so perfectly to make this Cold War-esque type music. And it's so memorable, again, for the same reasons as Modern Warfare 2. And then we go to Black Ops 2. Same thing for its multiplayer theme, just dubstep, bass and drum, all that. And it makes it so memorable because everybody has so many fond memories of Black Ops 2 because at around the time where a bunch of Call of Duty's were coming out that people didn't like, Ghost, Advanced Warfare, Black Ops 3, people kept coming back to Black Ops 2, loaded up and they would always hear that familiar theme. Hell, you can even make the same argument for zombies with the piano. The last Call of Duty that I'm going to talk about is World at War. World at War's soundtrack is much drastically different than its other Call of Duties. It has an eerie sound to it. It makes you feel dreaded that you're in World War II. It has just a straight up eerie, creepy soundtrack, and I think it's what makes it the most memorable with its gritty tone and its creepy music. If you guessed Team Fortress 2, pat yourself on the back because that's what's next on the list. 
TF2 was a game in development for a very long time, but released in 2007 and instantly became one of the most played games of that time and is still being played by 60,000 people to this day 14 years later. So without having a great art style, gameplay, and a thriving community, it has to have a soundtrack that goes along with it, right? Well, duh, that's what I'm talking about it. Team Fortress 2 has an immaculate soundtrack, but just like Call of Duty, you only hear them in the main menu. Each song has their own unique tone that goes along with the game as well. For an example, the main menu theme. When you hear that ticking clock, you know exactly what game it's from. The main theme perfectly encompasses the 60s style that the game is going for. Every song that is in Team Fortress 2 is a hint of almost anything that you can expect along with the game. Silliness, serious, goofy, just a whole bunch of different tones with each song that perfectly goes along with this game. An example I can give you that has so much personality is Medic, the song, not the character. I guess it can go along with the character as well. The song perfectly makes you think of a medic when you hear it and if you were to watch meet the medic you also know when exactly this plays and it's so memorable because it gives you the idea of a medic uber charging a heavy or hell it doesn't even have to be in the game all the time to make it memorable the song intruder alert instantly reminds me of the intro to meet the spy the soundtrack is just like the game it seems like it'll never die or go away or ever get old and it's here to stay Come on, if you didn't guess this, then I don't know what to tell you. This is Metal Gear. Metal Gear has what I like to call situational music. What do I mean by this? Music that plays when certain situations are happening, such as Encounter. Whenever you're caught, the song called Encounter plays. loud and jumpy and it makes you feel like oh shit i just got caught i need to go hide i need to disappear from these people's eyes or when you're playing metal gear solid 2 and you're on the plant and you hear the sneaking song that just makes you feel like I need to stay undetected. I need to stay hidden. The music makes you feel immersed in the game. Again, whether that's you just got caught and you need to hide or you're sneaking around or even boss battles. But not all of Metal Gear's music is situational music. One of the most memorable songs I can think of for Metal Gear is Snake Eater from Metal Gear Solid 3. While Metal Gear has always been super weird and funny, the music that accompanies Metal Gear Solid 3 makes it feel more like a spy movie like the game was intended to be and perfectly sets the mood for the player. While I've only played Payday 2 for a short time, something that stood out to me instantly was the soundtrack. And just like Metal Gear, it's situational music. When you load into a map, the music's all calm and quiet and it's just kind of there. But if you get caught or you have to get into a battle, it instantly shoots up to a 10 and everything is jamming. It makes you feel like I need to get my shit and get out of here. But when it's all quiet, it makes you feel tense, it makes you feel like I don't need to be caught. The less interaction with people, the better. Like I said, I didn't play it Payday 2 that much, but when I did play, I always remembered the soundtrack. And with a third one leak, I can only hope for more bangers to come in the future.
This one was probably a hard one, but it was Need for Speed High Stakes. This of course is a racing game, and in the 90s and early 2000s, these games had a genre of music called drum and bass. And it's what makes this game very memorable to me because it was the first game that introduced me to this genre of music. Each part of this game is also accompanied along with its own song, such as The Car Showroom. To Quantum Singularity. To Bionic. Like I said, this game was the first time I've ever heard of the genre drum and bass, and I fell in love with it. It has a high intensity that goes along with the race that you're currently competing in, and it's what I love about this soundtrack. It is no surprise to anyone on what this is from. Doom, an FPS that when it was released, revolutionized the gaming world with its blood and gory gameplay, and at the time, was the best graphics on the market. But the Doom franchise wouldn't be the same without the music that accompanied the game. The original Doom soundtrack was heavily inspired by bands like Metallica, Slayer, Alice and Chains, and so on. If you don't believe me, here, listen to E1M1 and The Master of Puppets by Metallica. It is safe to say that Doom soundtrack is very much heavily inspired by a lot of heavy metal bands. And that's okay, because it's what makes the original soundtrack so memorable to a lot of people. But you can't talk about Doom soundtracks without talking about... the new Doom soundtracks. The composer Mick Gordon was an absolute genius when he made the soundtracks for both Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal. It goes along perfectly with Doom's non-stop action, blood and gore, and countless demon slang. The soundtrack to Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal is, of course, heavy metal, and Mick Gordon doesn't mess around. Every track in this game is intense and makes you feel immersed and like a badass when you're killing all these demons. Of course, you can't talk about Doom without BFG Division. Again, Mick Gordon does such an amazing job with the soundtrack, making you feel the intensity and making you feel like you're the baddest motherfucker around. But wow, you feel this intensity, feel this emotion of anger and rage. The next track is going to make you feel quite the opposite. You couldn't guess, it's Red Dead Redemption. Now, before I get into it, I must say, major spoilers ahead if you have not completed the game. Go ahead and skip to the next chapter. While the whole soundtrack to Red Dead 2 is, of course, a cowboy western theme, the one song that stood out to me was the song that started playing when Arthur died. May I Stand Unshaken plays when Arthur's crawling to his death. Now, of course, I'm talking about the high honor ending. After you get into a fist fight with Micah, Dutch and Micah both leave you on the cliff and Arthur crawls to the edge of the cliff, leans against the, a rock and looks out into the sun as it rises as he takes his last breath. Not only does the music make the scene a thousand times sadder, but playing this person that you never knew anything about, slowly getting to know him, and when you finally feel like he's your best friend, he's gone.
Silent Hill is all about tone and ambience to make the player feel uneasy about what they're doing and what they're playing. There's already been a billion essays about Silent Hill and its soundtrack, so I'm just gonna keep it brief. Akira Yamaoka is a genius when it comes to music and sound for this game. A lot of it makes you feel dread and despair, or it can make you feel happy or relieved, or it can even make you feel sadness and depression. Akira was really good at using not only what he had at the time to make this wonderful soundtrack. Like I said not too long ago, there's been a billion video essays about Silent Hill and its soundtrack and how it's a masterpiece. And I'm gonna have to agree with them, but let's go ahead and move along to the next section. While Silent Hill was more psychological horror, and it used its soundtrack for that, Resident Evil uses its, mostly its gameplay for it, but that doesn't mean it can't have a good soundtrack. While a lot of the music in Resident Evil is mostly forgettable, or just there to fill Silent Void, a soundtrack that is present in almost, if not all, Resident Evil games is the safe room theme. Or safe room music. When you enter a safe room, the first thing you're greeted with is relaxing, peaceful music. They make you feel at ease, to make you feel you can take a break from the horror that's going on outside. You know you are safe once you enter this room. While every Resident Evil has its own safe room theme, the most notable ones that I can remember when I was playing Resident Evil was the Resident Evil 1 Remastered safe room theme. Resident Evil 2. And actually most recently, Resident Evil 7. Unfortunately, just like how Silent Hill's last couple games have strayed away from the original idea or haven't captured the original idea, so has Resident Evil. But as of Resident Evil 7 and 8, I can see that the series is starting to go back to its roots and I can't wait for more installments. If you didn't guess it, it's Minecraft. What can I say about this game soundtrack that hasn't already been said? Minecraft is another game that is still going strong 10 years later and is still being played by millions of people. But out of the millions and millions of hours played, something that has always stayed with everyone was the music. Made by C418, the main Minecraft soundtrack is a mixture of fun, creative, and chill music along with a somber, nostalgic feeling. For example, when I hear Key, I, for some reason, feel a sense of nostalgia and sadness knowing I'll never be able to experience Minecraft for the first time again. But then it can switch to a happy feeling such as Moog City. This whole section was from a person who grew up with Minecraft for half my life because I'm 20 years old. And Minecraft is a game I take personally to my heart because it played a large part in me growing up. So when I hear the soundtrack playing, I'll always remember the first time booting up Minecraft in wonder and excitement.
Alright, if you didn't know what this is, then you clearly never played any form of video games, like, ever. This, of course, is Super Mario. One of the most revolutionary games ever to come out. Not only did it change the way that games were made and played, but it also has some pretty good soundtracks. Now, of course, the original Mario only had, what, like four? But what started from a small group of songs later turned into thousands and thousands of hours of great soundtracks. Again, personally, some notable soundtracks that I remember growing up was mostly two Marios from the GameCube era, Mario Sunshine and Mario the Thousand Year Door. Let's start off with Mario Sunshine. Mario Sunshine took place at a tropical resort in the Isles of Delfino. Now, if you've ever played Mario Sunshine or make gaming content, it doesn't even have to be gaming content, just something related to gaming content. They'll probably use this song as background music. That is the main hub theme for Super Mario Sunshine. It's very catchy, very recognizable, and it has always stuck with me since I first loaded up Mario Sunshine. Of course, just like how this one sounds tropical and jumpy, almost every other soundtrack has that same vibe, a tropical sounding type song, because of course it's set in the Isles of Delfino, a tropical resort. Another Mario game that I mentioned was Super Mario and the Thousand Year Door. Personally, I love this Mario. This is my favorite Mario game of all time. The gameplay, the art style, the music, everything comes together and makes this game for what I believe the best Mario game ever. Again, a thing that I always remember from most video games, just like I've been talking about this whole video, is the soundtrack. And Thousand Year Door has one of the best Mario soundtracks in my own personal opinion. An example is like when you go up against bosses such as the first boss, Hooktail. The music comes together and it makes you feel like, oh, this is the first boss, I gotta get it. Or when you go up against Dupless, it's supposed to make you feel crazy and confusing because, well, that's the point of Dupless if you've ever played the game. Or when you go up against the final boss, the Shadow Queen. This is final boss music. When you listen to it and you play the game, you think, oh shit, this is it. This is the final boss. It's intense and it makes you feel like it's life or death. But again, those are my personal opinions. Of course, you got Mario 64. You got Mario RPG, actually. You got Mario Galaxy. You just have a whole lot of Mario Brother games that have such a great soundtrack and it's a memorable for everybody in their own personal opinion. And just like how Mario has great background music, so does this indie hit, A Hat in Time. A Hat in Time is a 3D platformer that deals with you being someone named Hat Kid and you go around collecting time pieces that were dropped down onto Earth by accident. Each world has its own personality with the soundtrack, from Mafia Town to Subcon Forest to even Battle of the Directors and many more, all come with their own soundtrack that's unique to that and makes it have its own personality. Along with the two DLCs and the Death Wish mode came a lot of soundtracks that were so good, especially with Death Wish. I can't wait for a second game or more DLC to come out because the soundtrack to this game is so good for an indie game and I can't wait for more.
yes, it's Undertale, but I'm not going to talk about Undertale. I'm going to be talking about Toby Fox. Just to put it out there, Toby Fox is a musical genius. From what he put out from Undertale and Deltarune, he is a wizard at making recognizable and memorable songs. Let's just start off with Undertale. Everything from this game is so memorable. Hell, I've listened to the soundtrack before I played the game, and I fell in love with the music instantly. And once I finally played the game, it made it a hundred times better knowing where these recognizable songs were going to play. Every song fits so well with each character, and I'm surprised it took me up until 2019 to finally play Undertale, but when I did, again, I instantly fell in love with everything. And I can say the same for Delta Room. For chapters 1 and 2, the music isn't as good as undertale but there's still a lot more chapters to come but some bangers that i've heard from deltron is attack of the killer queen field of hopes and dreams and my personal favorite rude buster i can't wait to hear what's in store for the next chapters of deltron and i hope toby fox continues to make bangers as well Yes, it's Zelda, but unfortunately, I haven't played enough Zelda to really tell you about the music, but that's why I've brought in some help. So, to help me out with the Zelda section, here's my good friend, FD Rod. The Legend of Zelda is a unique franchise in that music not only sets the tone, but serves a primary function in many of the titles. From the Ocarina of Time, to the Full Moon Cello, to the Wind Waker, players are encouraged to take an active role in the game's soundtrack. It's not often that the bard gets to play the main character in an RPG franchise, and as you'd expect, this means the musical team has to bring the fire. And under the direction of a man named Koji Kondo, they've hit every single mark. <laughs> Disclaimer, The Legend of Zelda is an old franchise, 35 years old at the time of writing, with 27 individual titles under their belts. There will be no delusions of objectivity here. This is a list of some of my FDRAR's favorite Zelda tracks because I operate under the philosophy that each Zelda title should be taken in its time and place, and that the reaction each individual might have with the title ebbs and flows with the audience's life. I also happen to think that that's the most important factor in measuring the impact of a Zelda song, so I can't really be objective here. That said, let's try anyway. Song number five is The Ballad of the Windfish. This track is from Link's Awakening and is composed in the key of C minor. This haunting, eerie melody can be transposed to multiple instruments, giving each their own opportunity to express the somber, yet almost wisdom-filled notes. If you've ever played Link's Awakening, this track likely lights up a trillion neurons in your brain. If you haven't, you can probably still feel what the rest of us feel. It's dark, it's full of lament, it's somehow also open and adventurous, yet world-weary. Ultimately, this track sets out to do a lot of things, and I believe it accomplishes most of them. Song number four is the Lost Woods theme, or Saria's song from Ocarina of Time. This is a song that just perfectly encapsulates the theme of the Lost Woods. It's jaunty, it's uplifting, it jumps up and down and all around and makes you want to party. Looking at you, Darunia. This song is just fun to listen to, which is good because it not only serves as the theme of the Lost Woods, but as the path through it. The volume of the song is used to judge the correct path through the Lost Woods to the player's objective. Side note, it can also be used with Child Link to share a tender moment with the sequel's main villain, Skull Kid. Don't try this with Adult Link. Song number three is Zelda's Lullaby, which is easily one of the most iconic songs in the series. Notably, this track is repurposed from a lullaby to the score of Princess Zelda sacrificing herself to save Midna in The Twilight Princess. In this scene, the track is given new feeling, contrary to the soft, comforting renditions we've seen in the past. This song carries with it a deep history across multiple games that culminate in this one scene. This rendition of the lullaby has a way of sticking with you and even bleeding into your other Zelda memories, so I'd suggest any Zelda playthrough, try to position Twilight Princess after Ocarina of Time. Song number two is the Clock Town theme. The Clock Town theme is taxed with the task of portraying a town in denial about its own imminent destruction. It serves as a bridge between the blithe town population and the menacing moon barreling down on their bustling streets. And the way in which the music changes from day to day captures that feeling. Majora's Mask is a title wherein the hero of time is trapped in a three-day cycle he must repeat over and over again in an attempt to save the Clock Town from being destroyed 
destroyed by the moon. Controlled by that skull kid we talked about earlier. The town's guard wants the city evacuated, whereas the commission in charge of the festival wants things to go off without a hitch. As such, each day the moon gets closer and the townsfolk's cheery faces seem more and more bizarre. The music reflects this by speeding up the jaunty melody and introducing an ominous and sinister clashing theme just low enough to make you uncomfortable. Overall, this theme perfectly paints the scene it's in and helps make an already creepy entry even more spine-chilling. Song number one is obviously the title theme from The Legend of Zelda. This song is almost as recognizable as the Triforce itself, perhaps even more so. It was composed by Koji Kondo in a single night after finding out that the original track used for the title scream in this game, Bolero by Maurice Ravel, would not go into the public domain in Japan until after the game's release, according to interviews with series creator Shigeru Miyamoto and composer Koji Kondo. At the time, this game was meant to be a mixture of the adventurous elements of the dungeon exploring of Indiana Jones and the preternatural fantasy lands of J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings novels. Despite this short one-day crunch, Koji Kondo pumped out a complete icon of a track, one that has likely inspired no small percentage of the video game musical composition industry titans we see in operations today. In The Legend of Zelda, as stated before, music is integral to the adventure. It is intertwined with it. This is evident no matter the time restriction, no matter the decade, no matter the tools. From day one, this series has woven melodies into moments so seamlessly that even hearing some of these entries probably triggered a few childhood memories of your own. Always remember how dangerous it can be to go alone and take these melodies with you. This game doesn't need an introduction. We all know what it is. Of course, it's Halo. Halo to me, and I sure hope a whole lot of other people, was the start of our own gaming careers online. Whether that was playing with split screen, going online, playing with other friends, or just sitting in the main menu, listening to the music, waiting for everybody to get on. We all recognize Halo for its music, its gameplay, its art style. It's impacted a lot of our lives. To me personally, Halo 3 was the game that me and my stepdad bonded over. It was also the start of the time that I started playing online, finding other friends. The first time I was ever called a squeaker, called Justin Bieber being cussed out by a bunch of 30 year old men. And just like all of those memories, Halo's music is also something I will always remember Halo for. Martin O'Donnell and Michael Salvatore not only made the best soundtrack for a video game, but made it last through time. I can still remember playing Halo 3, either from the campaign and just getting immersed by the music, we're waiting in the lobby for the next map to load. We're getting excited when doing the Warthog run. Halo 3 was a masterpiece along with its soundtrack but the same can also be said about Halo ODST. Thank you. 
a somewhat forgotten Halo game by most casual Halo fans, but regardless of its status, one thing people all know is the soundtrack is yet again another amazing composition. Ditching the sharp, fast orchestral music, it goes to a slow, somber, smooth jazz type orchestral movement. The music is able to capture the lone ODST soldier traveling amongst the dark streets of New Mombasa trying to sneak past enemies finding his squad. Halo ODST, in my opinion, has one of the best soundtracks in a Halo game, but right next to it is yet another great soundtrack. Halo Reach was not only a game universally loved by almost everyone, but was also another great with its soundtrack. I remember Halo Reach very much as not only did I play the beta, but it was the first game I ever pre-ordered. Loading up the game, you're instantly met with horns and drums telling you the story on what's going on of this prequel. Then after that, you are led into the main menu when you're greeted with this. Just like Halo 3, it uses an orchestral type music, but it's a lot more sharper, a lot more faster, a lot more intense than Halo 3's. Halo Reach was the first Halo that I played in its prime, along with other people who are around my age. That's why they remembered so much. The gameplay, the trash talking, the forge mode, the campaign, the music, everything that was added into halo reach revolutionized halo onwards and halo reach is well put down as one of the greatest halos to come out now i liked halo 4 and i liked halo 5 but their soundtracks just didn't bring the punch that bungie's halos did not to say that there weren't bad ones like in halo 5 i liked the blue team soundtrack But something safe I can say is that Halo Infinite is a return to form. Originally this video was going to come out before Halo Infinite's release, but after it was released and a lot of software interruptions and glitches, I decided to go back and re-record this part. Halo Infinite is a return to form in its soundtrack, gameplay, and everything. It brings in old Halo mechanics, but it also introduces new ones as well, so it doesn't feel stale. Same thing with the music, it's old but it's new. There's a lot of old soundtracks in there, but there's also a lot of new soundtracks that sound like Halo, that make it feel like Halo. I am just so glad that 343 was able to bring back the spirit of Halo with Halo Infinite. While there is a lot of glitches and a long ways to go to fix a lot of things in the game, I can safely say that Halo Infinite will join the Halo grades one day. Well, that was it. I'm so glad you guys could come by and listen to my own opinions as well as friends' opinions on video game music. Hopefully you agreed with me on some and maybe you didn't on others. But until next time, later.